Hi, everyone, and a really warm welcome to today's webinar on the upcoming conference of the parties of the UN Climate Negotiations, COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, the, the conference was originally planned to take place last year, but uh, due to the pandemic, it was postponed one year to November 2021, and will thus start in just a few days. Uh, the conversation today will discuss what is at stake uh, at this year's conference, and we will do so by focusing on the world's largest emitters uh, and their goals, expectations, and roles. Uh, we, will, we will hear from China, the United States, uh, the European Union, and India. And uh, to discuss this, I have a very distinguished panel of experts. Uh, we have uh, Niklas Brienberg, who's senior researcher at UI's Europe program, an expert on EU foreign and security policy, and an expert on climate change and security. We have Jan Hallenberg, who is research leader at UI and an expert on US foreign and security policy. We have Heidi Wang Kading, who is lecturer in international relations at Kiel University and an expert on China's role in global environmental governance. And we have Axel Nordenstam, who is a PhD candidate at Stockholm University, focusing on Indian foreign and climate policy. And last but certainly not least, by my side, I have Gunilla Reichel, who's head of, the, of UI's program for global politics and security, and an expert on international climate and energy politics. And Gunilla will help us to frame the discussion today and um, understand the sort of general conditions for this conference. And the session today will run like this. I will digitally visit each and every one of our panelists to discuss the most pressing topics related to their countries or regions of expertise. Uh, and I encourage all of you who are listening to post your questions during the webinar uh, in the Q&A function that you can find here below. Okay, so we, and at the end of the session, we will try to make time for as many as possible of your questions. So fire away. <laughs> Uh, so before we visit the country experts, uh, we will start the discussion by turning to you, Gunilla. Uh, can you tell us what's at stake at this conference? Why does COP26 matter at all? Yes, well, first, uh, the broader goal is to contain the rise of global temperature to 1.5 degrees. And that means that we need to cut carbon emissions much faster than countries already are doing today. Uh, and the danger of missing that target is more apparent than ever. And uh, the window of keeping it becomes more narrow. Uh, so the stakes are very high and time is of the essence. Uh, so if we back a bit to the 2015 agreement, Paris Agreement, which was a groundbreaking agreement where, in, where almost 200 countries signed up to act on climate change, they committed to limit the global temperature rise to below two degrees and to aim toward maximum 1.5 degrees. And this two degree warming would still be very severely damaging. And so the focus today has moved to 1.5 degrees. So that's something we're going to hear a lot in the negotiations, how to keep to 1.5 degrees. Uh, this is a much tougher target, but it's also a safer target. Uh, so what all the countries that signed up to the Paris Agreement uh, decide, uh, agreed to do was to submit plans for how they plan to reduce emissions. And uh, these plans are known as Nationally Determined Contributions, NDCs, which is also something that we will hear a lot about in the mm -hmm. negotiations. And every fifth year, uh, the countries must submit a new updated NDC. And COP26 will be the first opportunity since the Paris uh, Agreement or the Paris meeting uh, for the countries to upgrade the embassies. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we look at sort of the context of the meeting, we have seen the recent IPCC report, uh, which is, where the latest science shows that actions need to be taken now. And 
also it shows that there's disconnect between science on the one hand and national and international politics on the other hand. Uh, so COP26 needs to signal a shift from making commitments to implement actual policies. So it needs to move from commitment to implementation, so to speak. Uh, so that's sort of the broader context and uh, why it's uh, so critical. Mm. Uh, but then we have some key issues that will be discussed. So uh, first we have the, the broader goal that I said is to, to keep the 1.5 goal alive. Uh, it's about to get countries to do much more than they are doing today, to make stronger commit co commitments and to be more ambitious. And COP26 hosts will try to create carrots and sticks to, to uh, motivate laggard countries to make more forceful action. Uh, then, apart from that, there are several other uh, important issues that will be discussed at negotiations. So, for example, there will be talks about setting rules for the carbon markets, uh, in particularly how actors can trade carbon credits with each other, which is a quite difficult area, <laughs> as many of these issues are. Uh, it was also uh, left from the last negotiation session in, in Madrid in, um, uh, in 2019. Uh, adaptation is also a central part of the discussion, and adaptation is uh, how to sort of adapt to the impacts of climate change that we are already seeing today. And uh, another part, part of this, a part of adaptation, is how to compensate countries that are facing the impacts. Uh, and that is discussed under a heading which is called uh, loss and damage, uh, which is also sort of a contentious issue. Uh, then another aim of COP26, uh, which is very important, is to increase uh, uh, climate finance, uh, which help poorer countries to, to transition to clean energy and adapt to climate change. This is a very important issue for justice, uh, climate justice, for many developing countries whose people bear the largest burden from climate, mm. uh, they are climate change, but they have contributed least to it. So that's why, why this is a justice issue as well. Uh, so rich countries uh, earlier, they had already promised to contribute to, to $100 billion uh, by the year 2020. Uh, but this goal has not been reached. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, But still, many of the largest historic emitters are increasing their financial commitments, but many need to do much, much more. And the dis discussion here is going to be very difficult. And it's also going to uh, be very important for the trust in the negotiations between different partners. Uh, so... Also, you could say that climate finance underpins progress on basically all other issues in the negotiations. So if you can't solve that, it will be mm -hmm. difficult to continue. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so in general, some of these issues are very difficult and they are fraught with tensions. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have derailed negotiations in the past, as I mentioned, the Madrid meeting, meeting uh, uh, the most recent meeting. So that's sort of the um, the broader <laughs> Great. context. It sounds like there are a lot of challenges coming up. And you have talked about issues such as uh, finance, especially, but like raised ambitions, carrots and sticks to make countries do that, to keep the 1.5 goal alive, and uh, climate justice and energy transition and all that. Uh, but, I mean, it keeps you wondering, like, we do have the Paris Agreement from 2015. Uh, why, do we why are all these things left to discuss? Can we not just follow what was agreed in 2015? Yes, in, in one way. But, yeah. uh, but the Paris Agreement was uh, sort of um, the first step. And uh, it was also uh, the first uh, global universal agreement on climate change where all uh, almost 200 countries mm. are part of. And that was only possible when you sort of skipped mm. these more sort of uh, sensitive areas. So, so it's sort of built that you should raise ambition and, and um, uh, create and work on the rules uh, mm. year after year. So that's part of the process. Mm. Okay. And the conference starts on Sunday and will run for two weeks. Uh, so where are we right now? Like, does it look good or <laughs> are you worried? 
Well, it's a very difficult yeah. question when it comes to negotiations to sort of mm-hmm. that sort of, you know, success or failure uh, worries. But uh, we could say that the expectations on this meeting, it, it's extremely high because mm-hmm. uh, climate change has become such an important topic. And science, as I said, uh, is uh, sort of pointing that we need to take much stronger action. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is that this meeting will possibly not close the gap between countries' commitments Mm -hmm. and the reductions that are actually needed. And the problem with that is that it's going to be a big disappointment for many, Mm -hmm. uh, and this could be a challenge for the credibility of the political process. Uh, So I think it will be very important to show that the one5 five targets still alive, which is something the hosts are working for. So I don't think anyone believed that we will reach like mm. that that far, but uh, t- sort of they, they are working to keep that target alive and uh, to make this meeting a credible step on the road mm. towards sustainable uh, transition. Mm. Uh, so so that's, that's where we are right now. Okay. Um, and also the meeting is very, as you said in the beginning, it's affected by the pandemic mm-hmm. and uh, there is some risk of, uh, you know, trust issues, mm-hmm. particularly between the global south and global north, uh, which sort of, which have, because the, the sort of vaccine inequality equity that we have seen has sort of reminded on how rich countries have failed to deliver on, mm. on uh, certain issues mm. uh, for developing countries. So this could contribute to a less mm. willingness to, to sort of compromise. Mm. Um, so that's a bit of a problem, of course. Um, I would also like to mention that uh, this meeting it take place against the backdrop of a global energy crisis. Mm. And uh, that could sort of that ha- that has sort of offered a lot of fossil fuels advocates to like a new opportunity to sort that doubt on the transition and the costs mm-hmm. on transition. So that's also something that this uh, could sort of be a bit shaky for the discussions. Yeah. How has it mattered? The how has the pandemic mattered? Do you think for the preparations going up to? to COP26, uh, the pre-negotiations and all that. And I mean, does it also matter that it's two years rather than one year, which is the usual time gap since the last meeting? I think first we saw they had a lot of online uh, meetings. And um, as I understand it, it worked quite well, uh, but not to negotiate. Mm. It's very difficult to have a negotiated outcome from the online. So Mm. that's why many demanded to have a physical meeting Mm. uh, instead. It's also part of this sort of injustice because some countries do not have that access to internet. So Mm. it also becomes a bit more um, difficult to do that. and also, like this two years gap, I think it also plays into the expectation on this mm-hmm. meeting and uh, sort of the, f- the feeling of, uh, of the rush that mm-hmm. we have because we were supposed to do this last year and now mm-hmm. we're here. And uh, so, so that's, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Gunilla, for thank those you. initial words. And we will come back to you at the end of the session. Uh, and now we will turn to and talk about the biggest actor uh, actors at this conference. Uh, and we will start to talk to you, Niklas, who is an expert on the European Union. Uh, can you give us a picture of what's the role of the European Union in the climate negotiations and what expectations are there at the EU? Yes. Hi. Thank, thanks for inviting me and giving, this, uh, giving me an opportunity to, to address you and uh, on this very timely and, of course, important, important topic. Uh, I think... Um, Kind of jumping direct to your question, Elin, uh, on the role of the EU in, in climate negotiation. I think it's you could start by saying that the kind of the EU is keen to portray a self-image of of itself as a kind of a leader. It talks about itself as an, an that it has a leadership approach and it has leadership ambitions mm-hmm. going into uh, climate negotiations. And of course, historically, the EU has taken. Uh, a, a kind of a, um, a big role in shaping uh, many of the kind of international uh, agreements that we have seen uh, on issues re- revolving around climate, climate change, and, and environmental politics on a global and international level. Now, I think um, 
those of us who are focusing on these issues and also uh, thinking about the EU in this context, we kind of uh, all think about what happened a couple of years ago in, in Copenhagen when the kind of the EU uh, was seen to uh, its its approach um, did not deliver, so to speak. That there was a change in the um, in the landscape and the kind of international landscape on climate change negotiations. We at that time we were uh, leaving uh, the Kyoto Protocol, and I think a lot of uh, still in the EU and, and many others thought that it, that could be replaced. Uh, it did not happen, and and I think uh, the kind of the image of the EU as a leader was a bit tarnished after after Copenhagen. But I think it's also important then to stress that the EU has, I think, learned lessons from from that experience, and I think that also paved the way for the Paris Agreement, where the the EU is now much more uh, focusing on kind of building broader alliances and really trying to shape this agenda from from the uh, bottom up, and that also translates into the EU having a much broader um, set of instruments, tools in its foreign policy, but also kind of a broader external action that tries to address um, climate change from, from a number of, of, of perspectives and trying to s- somehow shape uh, the, um, the political landscape around these, around these issues. So I think Paris Agreement maybe was an, an, an outcome of, of that, or at least that the EU contributed to, to it. And the EU is, of course, deeply invested in uh, making uh, the, Paris, the Paris Agreement work, so to speak. So that is, is obviously a, a big part of, of how the EU sees its, itself. And what do you think, uh, what are the primary goals for the EU? Like when they go into the conference now, what do you think the European Union wants? What outcomes do they hope for? I think on, on kind of um, on, on the highest level or so to speak in, in general, they really, they are very keen on making the Paris Agreement work, right? So kind of um, saving it or, or making it work, making the logic or what, what Gunilla was, was talking about before, kind of continuously raising ambition uh, in, in, the, in these negotiations and, and, and really having the signatories to the Paris Agreement really come forward with ambition, uh, ambitious plans, mm. and also to the extent that it's possible, help uh, developing countries really kind of implement and make take effective actions on, on climate change uh, in, in their own countries. So I think that is, is something that, that the kind of the EU uh, comes comes in with or its, its approach. But we have also seen, I mean, the when it comes to the negotiating mandate, uh, we saw it earlier in, in this month, uh, the EU Council decided or decided that, you know, they should come to these negotiations trying to get uh, the parties to be more ambitious and, and kind of speeding up uh, the... Um, uh, the uh, kind of uh, the year or the, the time in which the the NDCs are going to be um, uh, renegotiated or, or revised. However, we also saw um, that there is an emerging maybe uh, disagreement also within EU countries on this particular issue. Uh, Gunilla raised the point on on rising energy prices, and maybe that has also somehow affected the um, the momentum within the EU in, in, in trying to kind of, um, you know, put up a very strong position towards towards uh, the meeting in, 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 in Glasgow. But I think that is, is, is one issue, kind of trying to raise the ambitions on, on the NDCs. Um, Gunil also mentioned um, carbon markets. That's also something that, that the EU is also very keen on advancing uh, within the Paris Agreement framework. And also, of course, raising ambition when it comes to international climate Finance, and that's also something that very kind of very, to a large extent, aligns with the um, external actions tools that the EU already has in itself, in its tool, uh, by itself, in its toolbox in order to address this issue. So, so you kind of you see that the EU is very much in line with the logic and the setup of the Paris Agreement, and is very invested in in trying to make it work uh, as, as as best as possible. Right. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, it seems like the EU has very grand ambitions with this meeting. But at the same time, the EU is not a state, in fact. And can you give us a picture of, uh, I mean, how have we gotten to this point? And uh, what are the issues sort of within the union and the conflicts within the European Union states that needs solving and that has been sort of hinders along the way? Sure. Um, yeah, th- I think that's a great question, right? So, what, what kind of an actor is 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 the EU? Um, it's not a state, obviously, but that is not necessarily, I think, a, 
it doesn't have to be a bad thing, right? I mean, it can compare to the US, obviously, a, a very strong actor where they can ship quickly, right? It's position on these issues. We saw it from the previous uh, Trump administration. Now we're back with, with Biden, so to speak. The EU, and particularly the commission, has uh, kind of a much more of a long-term uh, vision when it comes to these issues. So it kind of sticks to the agenda once the agenda is put in place. I think that is one of the key issues to really uh, focus on now. So how is... The, the kind of the big commitment that the EU has made through the European Green Deal. How is that translated into legislation? We saw the EU climate law being passed earlier this year. We see the kind of the Fit for 55 package where the EU has committed that it should reduce its carbon emission by 55% um, compared to the 1990s baseline. All these things obviously are, are, are you know, what we are focusing on, how can the EU put these ambitions and, and really kind of work towards what they have put in now as their you know, binding targets of climate neutrality for, for 2050, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know, re reducing emissions uh, by 55% towards 2030. All that is, I think, uh, is you know, in, 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 in the limelight, what would, would be uh, are focusing on. And I think the, uh, maybe the, the problem here, or what we are looking, what we are looking to, with with, with maybe uh, increased um, worries a bit, is obviously the impact of rising geopolitical tensions around the issues of climate change, um, growing political conflicts within the union of, of, between member states on this issue, um, and and I think that might be something that can kind of uh, uh, maybe dilute uh, some of the momentum in the EU, but. Com but you know, as you know, since you want to talk to, to more experts, right? But as a kind of a, a, a concluding remark, I think the EU is still one of the most ambition, ambitious actors here, and it has done a lot. And I think again, the the approach that the EU has, where it tries to align a lot of its foreign policy instruments, its 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 financial power, and also the kind of the ongoing work and trying to make all this ambitious kind of um, goals turn into legislations and, and, and policies is uh, um, an, an approach that the EU is very keen on and, and, and probably can deliver on, but we'll, we'll see how much. Great. Yeah, we have uh, several other people to talk to, but we still have a few, <laughs> few minutes uh, on your time. And I would like to just like pick up on a few things you were saying. Um, for example, you were talking about one of the strategies that the EU have is to, uh, to build broader alliances on this question. Can, do you have an example of other sort of states or regions or actors that the EU is particularly planning to cooperate with or are already doing? I think the, the EU is, I mean, there is um, uh, countries, like-minded countries, right, in the uh, developed uh, world that the EU is, is and has a long history of, of, of cooperation with. Uh, I mean, obviously now we see uh, the UK leaving the union, but the UK is very much aligned with, with I think, the EU, its approach and its, its, its goals when it comes to uh, uh, climate, uh, the kind of the broader international climate agenda. And there are other countries um, uh, that are on the same page. But when it comes to kind of building these broader alliances, I'm more also thinking about the, the EU's focus on, for instance, African countries and developing countries, where mm -hmm. I think they, at least in in, in the logic of, 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 of the EU, it makes sense to try to kind of, you know, build the, the whole climate change or transformation agenda into uh, the agenda of, of, of uh, you know, um, pushing for sustainable development. So I think that's something that we've seen uh, being increasingly uh, put into practice in, 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 in the EU, kind of building these broader alliances with particularly with the developing countries. Mm. And I guess that, I mean, <clears throat> uh, the EU, if, if we kind of go back to what we said in, in the beginning about the EU and its leadership ambition, I think really that is uh, something that it, 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 it's, it's um, emphasizing when you talk to uh, representatives of, of the EU and the Commission and, 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 and the Council is that the EU wants to lead by example. It mm -hmm. really wants to kind of show, and I think that's something that the EU also will come into uh, the, the Glasgow meeting in, in kind of making partners know uh, and aware of all the things that the EU is going on in the EU and, and try to shape this, this, this agenda and, and and making or having that as um, a means to put pressure on some 
and a source of inspiration for others. And I think that is, is something that the EU is very keen on, on, on trying to do. Mm. Well, great. Well, thank you. Just a final quick thing. What, what will you keep an eye out for during the meeting from your perspective? I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in uh, negotiations on, in, 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 in how, what kind of outcome we can see when it comes to corporate markets, since mm-hmm. that's, that's really something that, that could, you know, the EU is, again, trying to align climate goals with its broader foreign policy, also international trade policies, right? So in theory, that is where the EU could have a, a huge leverage, right? So if we could have a, 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 some meaningful international global rules on, on, on carbon markets, I think uh, you could see a lot more, at least in theory, more leverage from, from the EU and how it can use its you know, access to the European market uh, and, and its kind of broader trade agendas. I think that's it's going to be it's going to be super complicated, as Vinil already said. Um, and but that's something that I'll definitely keep an eye on. Great, thank you so much, Niklas. And uh, we might come back to you during the Q and A. And we will move on now to our expert on the United States, Jan Hallenberg. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, and then my first question to you is, I mean, for the ca- past couple of weeks uh, leading up to the conference, we have had signals that several important leaders might not actually attend the conference at all. What about Biden? Will he come to Glasgow? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that has never been a question. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, speaking of Biden, since the last uh, conference of the parties, the U.S. has had a presidential election, and uh, that resulted, obviously, in a new president and a new administration. What has uh, this meant for the country's climate politics? How long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's meant an it's immense change, and it mean, it's meant uh, most fundamentally, uh, Elin, it has meant that the U.S. has returned to the Paris Agreement mm. uh, process. Mm. I mean, uh, Donald Trump left uh, the international cooperation on, on these uh, environmental issues. Mm. And uh, I think on the first or the second day, uh, Biden uh, reintroduced the United States into the system. That is an immense signal that uh, this is very different policies that will be uh, pursued by this president. And, and I think, I mean, for him, Nick was talking about the role of the European Union for, for President Biden. I mean, the U- U.S. is back. America is back. We are coming back to the table and we are the leaders. And, and I think he wants to portray the fact that the United States is once again a leader on, on environmental issues. How successful he will be, that's another question. But I think that's what he's aiming for. And that's what I'll be looking for. To what mm-hmm. an extent will he and the United States be able to play the leading role that the president and his administration wants mm-hmm. the U.S. to play? Great. And that evokes the question, I mean, what possibilities does the U.S. have to be a leader? I'm thinking about there are great international expectations on the United States to be take a leading role in the climate negotiations and climate politics. But Biden also has the domestic sort of uh, public uh, agenda and uh, debate to to take into account. And I mean, does the domestic debate align with these external expectations or is there a clash of interest? And also in general, like what possibilities does Biden have to take a leading role in this? Uh, That's a complicated question. I mean, the U.S. is a complicated actor, just like the European Union. Mm. And let's distinguish between three levels. Um, One Mm. is the executive level, the president and the administration. Mm. He can do and his employees can do a lot of things on their own. They institute rules that are to be followed. And then there's a legislature, Congress, that passes laws. This is much more difficult. And at the third level, if we simplify, we have the states which have their own environmental policies to some extent. Where California, for instance, is a leader uh, that institutes a lot of uh, climate change policies that go further than other states and sometimes further than the federal authorities in Washington. That was Mm. a fight during the Trump administration. The Trump Mm. administration felt that California was going too far, for instance, with the uh, rules about cars, how much, how long should should they run on, on on the gasoline that's in the car? There are mm. rules on that, for instance. And if you wanted me to go in a little bit uh, further, I mean, mm. Biden has his own executive policies. He mm. has, for instance, decided that there will be much more uh, wind, windmills, uh, up to 30 gigabytes, I think, 
gigawatts. And that, that's an enormous expansion from the Trump, Trump administration. And that's something he can decide on or his, his, his people. Uh, and uh, he has also, he's added 26 new environmental policies as of mid-October. So smaller issues, but together they make a, a big change from, from previous policies. For instance, when, when uh, the United States looks at environmental reviews, looks at what happens when a law is passed, to what an extent should climate change be addressed in those reviews? Trump administration said there should be a minimal role. It doesn't matter. But Biden says very clearly it's very important environmental reviews of laws that are passed. To what an extent does this impact climate change and how? So these things are, are important. And there's a lot of those. And to those of you that are interested, the Washington Post follows these issues, each of these issues uh, regularly. What, what is the United States doing? What is President Biden doing? And what does it mean? Hmm. And then we have the big package. They are negotiating now in Congress on a very large package for 10 years of expenditure, which will likely consist of about $500 billion for environmental issues. Biden has, will delay his departure for Europe because he's going to meet some leaders in the House of Representatives to try to get this big package passed. Uh, he won't succeed, but he might, might get a little bit further. And uh, the most concrete policy that in that big package, from our perspective here, was the clean electricity payment program, which would reward utilities for increasing clean energy by 4% year over year and find them if they don't, those electricity producers. But that big process, that big package is out because Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, he has to vote yes because all the 50 Democrats have to vote yes to be able to pass this legislation. And this man is from a state that is the second largest producer of coal. Mm. And he owns coal shares. <clears throat> he has made millions on coal. So he says no. And then that plan is out. So we don't know exactly what will, will come back for or what will replace these policies. There will most likely, Elin, be funding for rural electoral cooperatives to accelerate decarbonization effects. There will be, be a new tax credit to, to be able, for the people to be able to buy electric cars. And there will be fee on methane emissions associated with oil and gas. So these are some of the things that will be in that package, we think, mm. if the Democrats are able to, to get their act together and really pass this legislation. That is not 100% certain. It's 85, 90% certain, but it's not certain. And Biden has been negotiating right up to this meeting because he wants to have the package. When he plays his leading role, he wants to be able to point to all these legislation has been passed. And this means that the U.S. is once again a leader. The EU, EU can think that it's, it leads, but in reality, it's the United States, and we have this big package. And he won't be able to come with that. Mm. And that's a drawback for him. And that will be interesting to look at for, for me as a U.S. Mm -hmm. specialist and for U.S. energy uh, and climate change but, uh, specialists. To mm. what an extent is the U.S. really able to play this leading role when it's not even able to pass its own laws mm. on these matters? And then you have, as I say, the states. Things are happening on the state level as well mm -hmm. that are not regulated by on the federal level. And right. finally, a lot of companies are changing their policies because they know the oil companies are for the first time saying, we understand that we cannot only live on oil and, and the gasoline. We must branch out into greener uh, energy production. And that is also happening. And part of the policies that Biden wants to institute is to quicken this process that is already going on. Hmm. Well, that's a long answer, but uh, so it, it's quite complex and, and it's a very big change from Trump. But Biden has so far not been able to pass these things into law to the extent that he wished Right. And that's really interesting. And it, I mean, it really gives a picture of these like different uh, straining forces that Biden has to take into account. 
Um, and when he and his delegation, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, that comes to Glasgow, I read there was about a thousand people coming from the U.S. in different positions. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you I mean, you have touched upon it, but what what are the primary goals? What does Biden want to come out of this conference? And uh, what do you think are the U.S. delegation strategies to achieve those goals? I think he wants to, number one, demonstrate that the U.S. is a leader. Mm. To uh, make the goals of the Paris Agreement more concrete and contribute to making those more concrete so that that the goal of 1.5% centigrade heating can be reached. Mm. So by setting the example again, he Mm. wants to be able to move other countries such as China or India or whoever you want to regard as laggards. But again, I, I think it will be more difficult because the United States has once again shown that it's very difficult to pass these laws. Mm. And this is, I mean, why is it so difficult? I mean, many Americans are aware of the problems of, of climate change. And some of them are quite willing to, to do something about it, let the politicians do something about it. But it's not, but it's not a question that is at the top of the agenda. Mm. At the top of the political agenda is the pandemic and, and economics more broadly. Mm. So, I mean, the politicians, particularly on the Republican side, don't feel the real pressure from uh, their voters. It's only on the Democratic side. And, and, and because there is the two-party system, it's for the Republicans, they use this as, as a tool to stop the d- Democrats rather than looking at the problems of their mantle. Mm. on the environment that they, as they should, right. I think. But, but they don't. I mean, they use it as a political tool to make it difficult for the Democrats rather than uh, try to contribute to the solution of the problem or the handling of the problem. Mm. And we will soon talk to experts on China and India. But from your perspective, I mean, what possibilities does, does the U.S. have to negotiate with the, those other superpowers and uh, to like affect them, them in a di- direction that he might? Want? I think, I mean, India, the United States has better relations with India than much better than it does with China. So, mm. I mean, there are some problems, some possibilities there, I would imagine. But I think... Our India expert will know immensely much more, but it's difficult, I think, on the domestic side and India doing a lot. Mm-hmm. When it comes to China, I know, I know more. <laughs> I mean, the, there has been a discussion within the American government. To what an extent are climate change issues essential, so essential that other issues in the bilateral relationship with China should be secondary? I mean, let's cooperate on on climate change, says John Kerry, the uh, diplomat in charge of of U.S. negotiations here. It's more important than all the other issues. Mm. But on the other hand is Mr. Jake Sullivan, who's the national security advisor. No, the Mm. bilateral relationship with China is most important of all our bilateral relationships. Climate change is only one issue along the others. We're not going to give them any uh, gifts there. So it's been very difficult, as I, I see it, to, to negotiate because the Chinese, as I understand it, and Heidi will, will <laughs> uh, elaborate on this, the Chinese are not willing to really negotiate in an atmosphere that is so bad as it is now. They don't want to negotiate on environmental issues if the U.S. is so aggressive, as they phrase it. So it's, it's been very difficult for the U.S. and China, I think, to come up with well, common strategies or at least parallel strategies. And I think that bodes badly for, for the conference, I, I, must, I must add. Mm. So I, I look forward to hearing what Heidi says, but that, that's the way I see it uh, with the bilateral relation there. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Jan. Do you have, uh, we're going to move on now, but do you have anything, any final remarks you want to say about U.S. at the climate negotiations that you didn't have time to say? <sighs> No, it's, it's, it's striking that this issue is still not at the top of the U.S. political agenda, I would say. I, that's my uh, Great. final remark. So well, far. it will be interesting to see uh, how Biden plays the game at COP26. As, and before we move on, I would just like to encourage again everyone who is listening to ask questions in the Q&A function. Uh, and we will come back to them at the end of the session. 
So we will move on to, to China and very much welcome our guest, Heidi Wang Kading. Welcome to the seminar. Thank you so much for inviting me to this very meaningful and insightful discussion. Great. We're very happy to have you. And uh, we might start where Jan finished off. Uh, do you have any comments on what he said about the US-China relations in, in climate politics? And are, are the Chinese not really interested in cooperating when the US is so aggressive in their language? Mm. Yeah, this is a very good question and also a very hot topic for many of us to observe. Mm. But I agree with Yan that uh, this COP26 happens in the context of the geopolitical tension between China, the United States and also its allies. Mm. So that's why it's particularly interesting to observe the role of China in global climate politics. Um, as in the structure of uh, this um, seminar, um, you have highlighted that China is the largest emitter and also uh, it is also stretching its economic model to other countries through the Belt and Road Initiative. And um, so by 2018, countries involved in the Belt and Road Initiative already cover or produce 55% of carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions globally. So uh, what happens in the Belt and Road Initiative is also very interesting to, uh, to observe, observe. So in, in a very um, short note, uh, the China is very important because also the, the she sheer size of its population and also its um, CO2 emissions. So China's problem is also the world's problem due to the connectivity of climate crisis um, on the global stage. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I think the whole world is uh, sort of watching the what China will do in climate politics since they're such an, an important and crucial key actor. Um, and uh, I mean, several of the countries and regional perspectives we have lift forth here today are both actors with high ambitions, but also really high emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as for China, I mean, how can we understand these sort of really from their perspective, really high ambitions together with the really high emissions? Like, how do these two go together? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And this also links to the uh, domestic sources and international pressure of China's climate commitments. Mm. Um, so as you have mentioned, China is very ambitious to also pro project itself as a global leader in the global <laughs> climate um, um, and negotiation and also cooperation. Um, so that's why we have seen uh, Xi Jinping uh, made very high profile uh, climate pledges uh, last year and also this year. So the main takeaway from uh, his climate pledges is that China will peak in the carbon. So the yeah it will peak in the carbon production in 2030, and mm. then it aims to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. Mm. So that too many yeah it the reception of those climate um, pledges differ uh, depending on where you are. Um, so many. Western observers uh, regard this as uh, not as ambitious because it's relatively easy for China to achieve the peak, a 2030 peak. And okay. um, so that's why they, they uh, speculate maybe China, so Xi Jinping Chinese leaders wants to underestimate and then over deliver. And through that, they can demonstrate or uh, reinforce their leadership position. Um, mm -hmm. However, if we look at domestic reaction to those pledges, it actually surprised many um, domestic stakeholders um, because of the radical change uh, and also it's um, um, a big statement towards the energy sector. So how to um, make sure that by 2060, the fossil fuel uh, will only contribute less than 20% of the energy mix in China. So it's not something uh, to be taken for granted, um, so to speak. Um, so that's why uh, it's also important to observe, um, as you have highlighted in, in the question, what actors are actually involved mm. in determining the country's climate policies. Mm. Um, at the moment, we can observe very top level design of climate policy and climate pledges in China. So um, in the, uh, so as Yang has mentioned, the US has, very complicated, but clearly delineated um, um, 
uh, separation of power in their government. And in China, um, it's, it's less the case, but still very complicated because it's, it's fragmented. And um, even for climate issues, we are involving a lot of ministries to come up uh, with a climate policy, which both matches the international expectation and also reflects the domestic um, situation, uh, what is realistic to achieve. So um, the, the leading, the, the most top level uh, organization is called the, so a small leaders group. And that is chaired by uh, China's vice premier. And he has also experience in uh, coordinating climate uh, the policy in China. Um, uh, and also this um, a small leading group involves a lot of ministries uh, like Ministry of Environment, Ecology, uh, National Development and uh, Reform Commission and also Ministry of Finance and Technology. So that means um, it is uh, climate change is very top on the agenda of Chinese leaders. And that is very clear. Um, and that's also very maybe different from the situation in the US where when you change a leader, um, the position on climate change or the commit uh, commitment could also shift. Mm. Um, so, and um, the two leading ministries in climate policies are um, the National uh, um, Reform uh, Development and Reform Commission, and it has long tradition of uh, developing climate policies because it also uh, it is also in charge of the macroeconomics policy and also energy policies. So, it makes a lot of sense to link climate policy to the bigger macroeconomic um, strategy, uh, national strategy. And um, in 2018, there is a cabinet reshuffle, which is intended to streamline climate policies and environmental policies. So that's why that uh, task has been shifted to the newly founded Ministry of Ecology and Environment. Um, however, um, that design has been reversed uh, just recently because the NDRC still has a lot of expertise and um, experience in handling climate uh, politics in China and also internationally. So that said, so the main takeaway from this detail of the change of ministerial leadership is that um, uh, climate is a very complicated issue and it requires a coordinated and orchestrated uh, policy linked to energy, linked to economics. Um, and of course, we're also um, looking at various interest groups. Um, so to make sure that they enforce uh, environmental laws, there are pl plenty of environmental legislation in China. The, the main problem in China is, is enforcement and uh, implementation. So that's why we need to look at the implementation side of the climate politics as well. Mm. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> no, but that's really interesting. It's so great to get that like extensive picture of it. And if we focus more specifically then on COP26, what, what can we expect from China at COP26? And will Xi Jinping turn up at all? Yeah, that's why we don't know. That's uh, where the surprise is. Um, so I was checking uh, this morning whether it would come because... Uh, Yesterday, uh, the BBC reported that it is unlikely for Xi Jinping to come to Glasgow to attend in, in person. And so, so that has um, made a very interesting point about um, how to expect, what to expect from China at COP26. Mm. Um, so at the moment, it's still very much puzzled with uncertainties. Apart from the um, climate pledges uh, she has unilaterally made in the United Nations, Mm -hmm. um, there is no a clearer uh, alignment um, between those pledges and the 1.5 degree uh, goal and whether to make it even more ambitious. Um, and there is indeed a statement uh, or promise from uh, Xi Jinping regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. So mm -hmm. this is a way for him to address uh, in a different language about China, uh, how China could demonstrate its leadership in climate mitigation. So uh, it promises um, that it will not, that a road initiative will not fund fossil fuel uh, coal-fired power plants uh, along these projects. And that could make a big difference. So the climate action tracker actually estimated the pledge alone could lower global warming projection by 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees. So this is a very um, important signal from Xi Jinping and also reinforces its high level commitments mm. um, of China in, uh, in um, climate uh, mitigation uh, efforts. Um, however, we can also see, um, because we don't know whether she will come or not, so it's unclear 
uh, to what extent this cooperation could also be um, implemented and materialized. So the special envoy uh, from China, Xie Zhenhua, uh, he also had very rich experience in negotiating climate change. So he will join the conference together with the vice minister of ecology and environment. Mm. Um, so uh, it, it shows that China still wants to make a contribution. Um, however, if we compare maybe China's behavior this year from previous efforts, we can see a more evident um, desire and um, efforts to stake its leadership. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe not led by practice, but led by impressing people, impressing uh, all countries around the world that China is trying to make a big achievements and trying to, to lead the way and also to show that it is consistent in terms of keeping its climate promises uh, on the global stage. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's why I think we, we would expect China to maybe perform a little bit more uh, of its uh, leadership. And one example would be, I'm, I'm sure you have heard about that, the phrase of ecological civilization. And um, so that's, that's also the main theme of um, the biodiversity COP uh, in Kunming in China. So China is also hosting another important COP conference uh, domestically. And that's the theme, ecological civilization and also the shared human future uh, is the theme and ambition of China in terms of how to project itself and how to portray its leadership and its relationship with, um, yeah, mm -hmm. our, our shared future. Yeah. Uh, it's so interesting. And can you just, for those who doesn't really uh, are familiar with the concept of concept of ecological civilization, just briefly explain what that means? Yeah. And um, why it matters for China's environmental politics. Exactly. Um, this this phrase um, has been um, talked about back in 2007, but then it has been uh, put onto the um, elevated to the political agenda as part of um, uh, Xi's um, soft power projection, as well as uh, domestic um, uh, campaign to raise environmental awareness. So um, it is not, it's, it's not very much different from sustainable development, but um, ecological civilization tries to incorporate traditional Chinese culture, uh, Chinese philosophy uh, within this concept to make ecological civilization more Chinese, more a local concept. So that, that is easier for the domestic audience to understand why China should follow the foreign concept of environmental protection, mm. um, which um, the a concept which is, um, um, transported or uh, which travels to China through the uh, 1972 Stockholm conference. So mm -hmm. that, that's why Sweden is so important in, when we talk about uh, environmental governance and in, in more general sense. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, Xi Jinping also uses a very interesting picture to depict what ecological, e ecological civilization means. So mm -hmm. he said uh, it's, it's clean water, it's also gold water. And that means uh, ecological, so that means economic development uh, can harmoniously exist with environmental protection. There is no uh, very much um, contradiction. Uh, so that's kind of a very interesting imagination of the coexistence between ecological, develop e ecological pr protection and economic development. Um, and so it has been um, implemented in several policy narratives and several policy pathways. And a main feature of ecological civilization, I mean, two main features of ecological civilization on policy uh, would be uh, its focus on technological fix. So the, the ministries of uh, science and technology has invested a lot of research funding into clean energy, for instance, clean technologies um, to make sure that ecological problem can be addressed by technological solutions. And another um, a feature of ecological civilization is um, the incorporation of disciplinary measures to make sure um, environmental legislations in China could be enforced mm -hmm. and implemented, complied by particularly um, a powerful interest groups in, in China. So, um, so this, is, this is a concept both to the domestic audience and also the international audience, mm -hmm. but we'll hear more of it as it is now linked to the soft power um, a strategy of China. And as Yan has mentioned, uh, climate change is one of the few issues which China can find common ground and put aside disagreements on other issues. Mm. Um, and it has been used um, previously uh, after 1989 um, uh, to uh, re so 
Chinese government has used climate uh, uh, environmental issues to reconnect itself to the global stage. So we may see that uh, we may see that climate change is actually increased and more important than some of us have imagined to the Chinese leadership. Thank you. And just briefly to finish off our part here, uh, what will you personally keep an eye out for during the conference? Mm, I think I will look at non-state actors. I will look at how various lobbying groups in China would um, give pressure to uh, the, the chief negotiators and the language of the uh, chief negotiator. Or there, there must be ambiguity. And that's kind of the... the uh, the uncertainties of uh, multilateral cooperation, but I, I would also observe domestically how it is how it is perceived and to what extent is the high level co commitment uh, being able to be materialized uh, domestically. So that's where I'm going to observe. Thank you so much, Heidi. We might come back to you during the Q and A in a little bit. Uh, we will now turn to our India expert, Axel Nordenstam. Welcome to the conversation. Uh, Thanks for having me. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Uh, we have already discussed a few different leaders and whether they will be at the conference or not. Uh, and I saw that just now that uh, Prime Minister Modi will actually uh, attend the conference, as it seems right now. Uh, at the same time, India has not, uh, to my knowledge, up, uh, submitted an updated national determined contribution, NDC. Uh, so can you give us an image of what India's position is on uh, climate change issues? Yes, of course. And uh, thanks for having me and for this very insightful conversation thus far. Very many interesting points to uh, address. Um, so yes, Modi is about to embark to Europe, um, first for the G20 summit in Italy and then for Glasgow. Um, very recently, and this, is in, and this is important, the Indian climate minister, um, also the leader of the Indian delegation to Glasgow expressed that India has huge expectations on the summit um, and wants, I quote, a summit that is marked by um, action and implementation, end of quote. So action and implementation seems to be the starting point as India enters the negotiations. Um, regarding positions, um, Principles such as climate justice, equity, the common but differentiated responsibilities will remain important to India um, in Glasgow, but also afterwards. Uh, and this is very much linked to that uh, India was part, was one of the driving forces of the responsibility of the formulation of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities in the 80s. So it's, it has a special role in the Indian thinking about climate change and responsibilities, um, as we alluded to. Um, so this implies that India stresses that uh, industrialized countries, ultimately the ones that uh, cause the global climate crisis, have a special responsibility. And that responsibility uh, concerns climate action for the entire world. Um, so in Glasgow and also uh, in other areas, we will see an Indian push to increase climate finance with India urging rich countries to set up a mechanism uh, specifically in Glasgow. Uh, so for those listening in that are also going to Glasgow, uh, do know that climate compensation is considered to be one of the Indian priorities in Glasgow. Uh, at the same time, India wants to be part of a solution uh, and wants to be uh, seen as a responsible stakeholder in the negotiations. So India therefore pushes for a, renew for a very ambitious renewable energy agenda at home, um, which implies a target of 450 gigawatt um, installed capacity of, of renewable energy by 2030. So just as China is investing in renewable energy, India is as well, and has invested a lot of uh, political capital into that target. Um, and actually, one thing that is worth remembering is that India's climate diplomacy is broader than the negotiations. Um, under Modi, we have seen that India's leadership uh, ambitions have increased, and we now see an India that wants to shape the global uh, conversation about climate change. Uh, let me give you three examples here. The International Solar Alliance, the uh, Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, and the Leadership Group for Industry Transition, 
Um, Sweden is, by the way, part of two of these <laughs> initiatives. Um, and what I take from uh, reading Indian press prior to, to COP is that we can also expect two new initiatives being launched in the weeks ahead. Um, the first one, an, an issue-based coalition uh, called the Infrastructure for Resilient Island States, which basically would serve as a platform for climate finance for uh, smaller states, which India is expected to launch with Australia and the UK. Um, and secondly, the UK and India are also expected to push for green grids in Glasgow um, through a green grid initiative, the One Sun, One World, One Grid. So we can convene after COP as well and see uh, how this turned out. But uh, naturally, a lot of focus right now is on the negotiations, uh, but it's worth remembering that India sees the global climate debate in a broader uh, view here. And uh, Well, great. Yeah, we, it will certainly be really interesting to see in a couple of weeks where we landed with all this. Um, you were talking about the major energy transition that India needs to make and has already plans to do. Uh, can you tell us something more on how that is going? And I mean, does India have expectations on uh, like external actors uh, to help with this en energy transition? Definitely. Um, and. Uh... I think, look, it's it's not only a question of like expectations, but also a question of hope and a question of how India partners with the world and how the partnership about energy transition is being uh, played out. Uh, a, quite a monumental task awaits India that we must bear in mind here, namely the transition and the modernization of its society towards a towards a somewhat more uh, developed. Uh, society and a uh, so the modernization process that China will, has undergone it's currently happening in India mm. so this will have massive uh, implications for how India views the energy transition um, mm. and as many know India has also uh, huge reserves in terms of uh, coal reserves which is seen as a uh, secure way of, of ensuring uh, energy supply um, and this also affects how India sees the energy transition. Um, some interesting components here also imply uh, an awareness that uh, the energy transition in India will require massive investments. Mm. Uh, some modeling suggests that uh, the decarbonization of India's energy mix will require trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and India's expectation here is very clear. India expects support and financial backing from its partners and from external actors. So again, climate finance uh, is said to be a top priority and is a top priority for India, not only in Glasgow, but also in the broader conversation about energy transition. Um, and I think the expectation of, on climate finance was actually one of the reasons why the uh, US uh, climate envoy, John Kerry, went to India earlier this year. He has been there several times. Uh, with promises of more funding to India's energy transition. And it's also a way to uh, underscore the importance of the Indo-American relationship um, in these times of global frictions where U.S. values India and India values the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of that, I mean, um, you were talking about one of the primary goals for India during the conference is, it could be summed up as action and implementation. Uh, and I mean, who are uh, India's closest allies in this? Who are they hoping to cooperate with? Yeah, this is, this is a great question because uh, generally India sees the US and the, U and the European Union as the most important partners on climate issues. But in the negotiations, India has traditionally and historically been part of the opposite, on the opposite block of the, of, uh, the US and, and Europe. Um, yeah. So we'll see some friction here uh, in the negotiations. There will be demanding conversations, um, especially when it comes to the net zero uh, debate. Um, since, I mean, an expectation from the Indian side on when it comes to the energy transition um, is, that, uh, um, is that countries around the world should not get one single year for as a set target. 
but rather uh, see, but rather have a somewhat more flexible approach uh, in terms of goal formulation. Uh, so, so my expectation and uh, what I would uh, look at here is, is, of course, whether uh, partners, the US and the European Union, will show uh, unwillingness to give that flexibility in the negotiations for uh, when formulating policy on net zero. Mm. Yeah. And you were also talking about uh, these different, at least five initiatives that uh, that India is part of or um, has even initiated. And uh, one that I know something about is India and Sweden and the uh, partnership on the industrial transition. And it was a lot of big words about that a few years ago, uh, as there are in many of these sort of initiatives. Uh, but what, what is actually happening with that initiative? And has it had any actual implications? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it was launched two years ago at the mm-hmm. UN Climate Action Summit in New York, where mm-hmm. uh, India and Sweden co-launched the leadership group for energy for industry transition. Mm-hmm. Um, and this and this is also part of a global com- of a broader trend in the Indo-Swedish relationship, I would say, where climate change and climate action has become a top priority in recent years. Mm. Um, it's a bit early, to be frank, to say uh, if, to evaluate and assess its uh, impact, um, primarily because of the uh, because the sectors that are uh, concerned by it, sectors and steel primarily, are currently undergoing tremendous uh, transitions. So green steel is certainly part of of the conversation, but it has nevertheless been significant for the Indo-Swedish relationship, I would say, Um, since it offers a a platform um, and and brings some momentum to the Indo-Swedish relationship. And one should also remember, I mean, uh, yes, it was launched two years years ago, but we have seen, indeed, seen countries and companies that work together in this initiative to ensure uh, that heavy industries reach net zero by 2050. Uh, Mm -hmm. So there have been some activities, um, but uh, we'll have to return in three decades and see whether that was one of the reasons why we uh, might have reached uh, net zero in 2050 or not. Um, Mm. Yeah. Uh, So just to to finish off, Axel, uh, what will you keep an eye out for during the conference and the next two weeks plus a bit to come? Yeah, I mean, of of course, there will be some frictions that I will keep an eye on, but I think most of my attention will be on uh, new initiatives, uh, on on new issue-based coalitions, um, whether the European Union and India cooperates more on the International Solar Alliance, which is like the flagship project for, for Modi and is a way for India to project soft power in the world. Um, I will also keep an eye on whether um, how the conversations are going on green technology, specifically about with regard to the idea of a new global green hydrogen alliance, which is still being debated. Uh, so we don't have it on paper yet. Um, and that I d- and the idea for uh, this alliance was presented at UI last year but by Arunabha Ghosh, the CEO and co-founder of the Indian think tank CUW, um, which basically could increase the demand for green hydrogen. And I think this would be a very smart move ahead. Um, but it's not sure yet whether we will see uh, a global green hydrogen in, uh, alliance in Glasgow or uh, whether we would have to wait for that. Yeah, yeah, there are certainly many things to keep an eye out for. And uh, I mean, that's one of the major messages, I think, yeah, of our and conversation and our round here among the panelists today. So I would like to turn back to you, Gunilla, after we have visited all of our experts here. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about what has been said now? Well, first of all, this was really interesting to listen to. So thank you all for uh, contributing to this discussion. Um, I think well, <laughs> it has to be quite sort of <laughs> overall observations. But yeah. I think uh, first, even if the ambition is not enough as it stands right now, I think it's very apparent that countries and also other actors take climate change uh, 
more seriously than ever before. So we are in a sort of a new phase uh, in climate politics. And that leads to a six, second uh, observation on, on the issue of climate change. And I mean, it has been said before, but the Paris Agreement, it was a symbol, it symboled the shift in, in climate politics where instead of understanding climate as a single issue or a single environmental issue that were to be solved by, by an intergovernmental negotiations or by states, we see it as a much broader process. And several of you have been talking about this and it complicates things. Uh, it complicates how we view leadership, for instance. It's much more difficult to be a leader uh, in a broader process that climate is. Uh, you have all touched on geopolitics, trade, uh, uh, development aid, investments. So it's all about transitions. And all the states that we have discussed here today are, I mean, they are hugely important for the negotiations, for the future of climate change, for raising ambition. Uh, but still, we also have a lot of other actors that uh, are participating in, in climate politics. And so, so the question or the issue has become much, much broader. Uh, so I think that sort of reflects the discussion mm. here. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's been really, really interesting to listen to all of you. Uh, and I would also like to remind everyone who's listening to keep posting questions. We have gotten a few, but we have room for more. So don't be shy. Just post your questions in the Q&A function. Uh, and before we go to the audience questions, I would like to just turn briefly to Jan. Uh, you, if you want to comment on what's been said about specifically uh, China and India and their relations to the U.S. Uh, since that was after your uh, conversation. Yeah, I note that uh, Axel said that there are possibilities for, for cooperation between India and the US. And I think we, one could see this in a broad, broader context. I mean, the, there's an organization called the Quad, mm -hmm. in which the US and India uh, cooperate with Australia and Japan. And, and there's a broader alignment going on in Asia where the US aligns with different countries in, in, in uh, its contest with China. Mm. So I think there's a link between these issues. And then the link between these issues also makes it more difficult again to cooperate with China because for the United States, there's an immense focus now in its foreign policy on the confrontation with China. Mm. And, and that makes, it, uh, makes me a little bit more pessimistic about the possibilities for cooperation, at least between these two, two giants in, in, in the conference. And, and uh, so I, I think my, my, my uh, worries on this point have been um, confirmed, but uh, perhaps Heidi can address it once again. I, I, it's interesting to also to note that Heidi said that China wants also to play a leading role. So we have a competition here among all four actors. Everybody wants to play an, uh, an important role. And, uh, and that's going to be very interesting mm -hmm. to see how that plays out, whether that makes it more difficult to come to concrete solutions or, or whether it contributes to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. That would be really interesting if we have this race in ambitions, um, and I mean race in, as in a competition, or if it will be all about money or if it will actually sort of hinder the process going forward. So that will be really interesting to look out for. Uh, we have had a question about the environmental collaboration between China and India, uh, which we haven't really touched upon. Uh, and I wonder, Heidi, would you like to say something about that? Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not an expert in the um, relationship between China and India, so I'll just offer my humble opinion and then um, transfer it. Uh, I think he knows more than I do in this regard. Uh, of course, there is a lot of... Um, there are a lot of opportunities for China and India to cooperate in um, climate policy and also in biodiversity um, conservation. And particularly in terms of climate mitigation, both countries face the dilemma of, um, so bo both countries are eager to achieve also poverty reduction in the process of climate mitigation. So of course there is exchange, there would be opportunity to exchange. And um, as Axel has mentioned, um, in the multilateral negotiation, we can also see uh, India um, using the developing country narrative to focus on equity and justice in terms of um, asking for more financial support from the developed countries. So that is also 
a common ground between China and in India. Um, and uh, I just uh, browsed an article um, published uh, by Harvard. I'll post it on the uh, Q&A session so um, our audience could have a more systematic overview of the opportunities and concrete actions in terms of India-China collaboration. So Axel, um, you have the floor. <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. Uh, Heidi. Uh, I'm, I'm also not an expert on uh, Sino-Indian uh, climate relations, but, uh, but certainly, I mean, in the negotiations, India and China have cooperated. We also saw that a couple of days ago with a, uh, with a statement by the, like, by the group of like-minded states, uh, where India and China took, a, took the same position. Um, but I mean, at the same time, uh, even though there are opportunities, I think we should also be aware about a quite a strong suspicion among the Indian climate elite and among Indian strategists uh, vis-a-vis India. Uh, and this is linked to many, to several reasons, but most uh, importantly, due to the due to the clashes at the border. Uh, that we saw last summer. Uh, and when I asked clim Indian climate experts about their views uh, on about China a year ago in a study for, uh, for UI that has been published, so if anyone in the audience could uh, have a look on US website, uh, they actually saw uh, China more as a rival than a partner, uh, which to me was quite striking about that even though there, there are uh, climate relations between India and China, they are still, there's still suspicion. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and I'll have a quick follow up on that, Axel, before we have a few EU questions for Niklas. But Axel, I, we also had a question about if the absence of the Chinese press, if Xi Jinping doesn't show up, does that affect Indians' uh, ambitions and their participation? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I mean, uh, they, one could easily think that, okay, well, the reason why Modi shows up is because President Xi has uh, created somewhat of a vacuum that India wants to fill. But I tend, I disagree with, with that analysis because um, in, Modi usually shows up at, at COP. Modi has been very outspoken about India's uh, climate ambitions uh, for like several years now. Um, and, it, and even though um, India did announce uh, uh, Modi's presence uh, quite lately, um, it was never really that much of uncertainty that India would not show up. And the reason for that is that uh, the UNFCCC, the convention and the Paris Agreement is very important for India. And, mm -hmm. and India is one of the uh, G20 countries that is actually uh, going on the track of, of following the 1.5 uh, de degrees goal. Uh, so India has the potential, the potential to pitch itself as one of the countries that uh, actually go is actually going in the right direction and will pitch uh, the 450 gigawatt uh, mm -hmm. renewable capacity goal at, at Glasgow. So I mean, for those reasons, I was counting with uh, with Modi, and I think that he will show up as well. Yeah, thank you, Axel. Uh, I will turn to you, Niklas, with a couple of questions regarding the EU. Uh, and one is whether the EU's trust in the American climate politics and American um, participation in the, in the conference of the parties has been harmed during Trump. Uh, well, that's an, an, a good question. Um, yeah, I think, yes, in a sense, uh, you could say it, it might uh, have been, been tarnished again. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that from, again, from, from the European perspective or from the EU perspective, the United States has always been a difficult ally when it comes to uh, climate uh, change or environmental, global environmental uh, cooperation. I mean, remember the, the difficulties we saw from, from the Bush administration previously on, on, and on, on the Kyoto Protocol. So, so I think that's, that is something that the kind of the EU uh, takes with it, even though it's also obviously recognizes that uh, the U.S. is a very important ally. And now with the Biden administration, I think um, the EU is very keen on striking while the iron is hot, so to speak, that really kind of take the opportunity to, to uh, somehow move the agenda forward uh, as much as possible now with a more kind of like-minded U.S. administration in place. Yeah. Yeah, and the other, thank you. And the other question is about Germany. Uh, Germany has, have, has the highest emissions in the EU, 
Uh, what is Germany's role in EU climate politics and at the Conference of the Parties? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, Germany is, is obviously an, an important player within the EU. It, uh, it's such a, such a large economy and also a large industrial power in, in Europe. So a lot of kind of what's going on in Germany affects uh, also what we'll uh, see uh, in practice uh, coming out of, of, of out of the EU. I mean, Germany is going to assume leadership in the G7 uh, next year. Uh, so I, I mean... On the one hand, Germany has a very kind of uh, ambitious and, and, and forward-leaning uh, position when it comes to trying to uh, push the agenda of international climate uh, negotiations. On the other hand, it has specific uh, challenges, of course, when it comes to its, uh, uh, on a national level, when it comes to its energy transformation. It has, you know, uh, we've seen its... its uh, attempt to embrace renewable energies in order to provide or for its industrial base, obviously. Um, there are people pointing to the kind of, um, the still uh, comparatively slow pace in which, for instance, the German car industry is, is, is um, changing uh, to, to electric cars and, and renewables. And also the, an, an issue that has been discussed at length for a while now is obviously uh, how Germany uh, really has an interest in having the economic relations with China, uh, you know, running smooth in a sense. And that also affects maybe a little bit how it's, um, you know, uh, how it's going to land on issues when it comes to such things like carbon uh, adjustment uh, tax or, or something like that. So I think Germany is definitely an uh, an a player, an important player, um, but it's it's at the same time complicated. It's, it's, it's such a big player that has some some of these kind of complex issues uh, involved. That, that there are similarities with the many other big countries here. That it's and this also relates to what Gunilla said that kind of the, the, the climate agenda is not is now so broad. It has to be since it's such an important topic, but it also becoming increasingly complex, mm-hmm. also at national levels to kind of have a. Um, an ambition and a straightforward position, so to speak. Yeah, certainly, yeah. And speaking of Gunilla, we have a couple of questions for her too. Uh, One is regarding the ongoing energy crisis and how is the ongoing uh, crisis affecting the negotiations? And can it in some cases even improve cooperation on these issues? Mm, That's a very interesting question. I mean, it's a quite recent development and the negotiations are, I mean, they are separated from that. Mm. So it will, uh, it's not going to have like a direct effect mm. on the talks. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, uh, it sort of opened up um, for a new form of not climate denialism, but uh, climate skepticism. Mm. Uh, and so instead of focusing on on uh, climate science, which has been quite prude, mm. uh, they tend to focus on the costs of transaction uh, transitions mm. and sort of so doubt about uh, whether or not if this is possible. Uh, so so uh, so it could have like it could affect the context, I would mm. say, but mm. not the actual negotiations. Okay, okay. And uh, speaking of the actual negotiations, we have had a question about indigenous peoples. And indigenous peoples are the one of the or a few of the groups. How the interests of indigenous peoples are going to be represented and addressed at COP26? Uh, unfortunately, I cannot answer that question Mm. Uh, but I mean looking at previous meetings because I don't know how it will play out Mm. during this COP meeting Mm. due to the pandemic but uh, in in previous meetings you have had this uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue Mm. uh, and trying to sort of catch different Mm. uh, stakeholders Uh, it's also I mean it's absolutely right that indigenous people uh, they are you know severely affected by Mm. climate change and they should have a voice uh, and the multi-stakeholder dialogue is not always working mm. <laughs> because it's the state that are negotiating. So it's mm. obviously problematic uh, when when these groups are not part of or represented mm. by a state. Mm. Uh, so, but I don't have a really good answer mm. to what's going to happen with that in, in COP26. Maybe mm. the rest of the panel know that, something about that. 
No. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose you could also compare it in some ways to to countries that are not as like uh, resourceful or p- materially powerful. I mean, just the difference in the delegations you're able to send. I mean, uh, delegations are representing states, of course, but there are many states that doesn't not have may that might be able to just send like. A handful of people comparing to, for example, U.S. as we said, that might have a delegations of hundreds or thousands of people. So of course there is a difficulty in how you can participate in the negotiations, and there is um, always a like um, a big need to for these actors to group together, obviously to have some say in the negotiations. But there are a lot to be said, I suppose, about equality and justice in that. <laughs> uh, okay. And um, we have just a couple of minutes left, so I will like finish off with um, one question to Heidi about the whether you think that China will submit a new or updated uh, NDC soon. Um, yeah, thank you. And thanks for the question. Um, the main negotiation is in char- uh, so. The main negotiation will be conducted by uh, the special envoy uh, and also um, his colleague from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. Um, and there are anal- there is analysis saying that uh, it is unlikely for the Chinese government to make more pledges than the one we have read. Um, but it's not um, everything is not yet settled. So it's uh, yeah. Still, I will keep also observing on that. And um, yeah. So so I, I don't I don't have an answer. If, if, and also a crystal ball to, to predict whether it will be the case or not. So uh, that's the suspense um, I want to leave here. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Uh, and I, the very final question also today will also go to you, Heidi. And uh, that is about uh, a question about why, why won't Xi Jinping be at COP26 if he wants China to have a leading role in the global climate collaboration? Mm. That's a great question. Um, I would maybe analyze from two perspectives, the international level and also the domestic level. Internationally, uh, China, so Xi Jinping has an increasingly assertive foreign policy. So he does not want to project himself as willing to compromise or make concession due to international pressure. So that's why this multilateral platform and also the circulating narrative from the UK already blaming maybe China would not attend and then uh, blaming China for lack of achievement do not actually work uh, to encourage China to come more. So that's the international uh, dimension. And domestically, we also need to bear in mind that China's economic situation is not doing very well. Um, And we see the first five-year plan, it does not have a GDP target, which is quite unusual for the Chinese um, political and economic context. So uh, one analysis shows that maybe uh, she is very much predominated by the domestic political stability, and he hasn't really left China since the pandemic. So uh, maintain- the maintenance of domestic political stability is uh, actually very key uh, to explain why he decide- he hasn't yet decided to uh, attend this conference in Glasgow. Yeah, right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for contributing with all your interesting questions. We really tried to have time for as many as possible. Um, On ui.se, our website, you can find a new thematic website on COP26 uh, with more readings, analysis, uh, podcasts and webinars on this subject. And I can particularly highlight the latest podcast episode from our own podcast, Utblick, uh, which is in Swedish, but it is with uh, Gunilla Reichel and the researcher Nagmen Nasritusi, uh, who talks about COP26 and uh, why it is so difficult to find political solutions on climate change. So please go in and listen to that. Um, And the recorded version of today's session will be available at our website in just a few days. So you can come back and listen to it again or uh, tip your friends. Uh, Follow us, UI, on social media for more updates on upcoming events and uh, different activities that we offer. Uh, I would also like to highlight... uh, 
um, event called Bakom Rubriken behind the headlines, which will happen on 30th of November. And that will be sort of a follow up to this conversation. It will be Sofie Berglund from UI and Nagme Nasrutusi from UI and Stockholm University, who will talk about the outcome of COP26. So that would be very interesting to follow. Uh, so with that, I would very much like to thank our panelists for their very uh, valuable insights and knowledge uh, and for sharing it with us. And a big thank you to all of you who were listening. Have a great day and thank you and goodbye.